Okay, today our lecture would be an outbreak investigation. Disclaimer. At the end of the session, the student should be able to explain the need for an outbreak investigation and explain the different steps in the investigation of an outbreak. Remember this case of Lichinella. At 8.30 in the morning on the August 2, 1976, Dr. Craven of CDC's Viral Diseases Division received a call from a nurse at Veterans Hospital in Philadelphia. The nurse reported two cases of severe respiratory illness, one of which had been fatal. Both people had attended the annual American Legion Convention held July 21 to 24. By the evening of August 2, 71 more of the people attending the conventions had the same illness with symptoms of acute onset of fever, chills, headache, malaise, dry cough, and myalgia. Further conversations with local and state public health officials revealed that between the 26th and August 2, 18 conventioners had died. Deaths were primarily due to pneumonia. An intense investigation began immediately. The incident became known as the first outbreak of Legionnaire's disease and led to the discovery of the gram-negative pathogen Legionella pneumonia. We need to investigate because we need to do the following. We have to control and prevent. This is a very good window for research opportunities, training opportunities. We have to consider programs and it has a lot of public, political or legal concerns. This of which we are currently experiencing now with the recent coronavirus outbreak. Control and prevent. A primary reason for a public health investigation is to control the outbreak at hand so that we could prevent future outbreaks in any investigation. You have to strike a balance between these two goals, depending on where the outbreak is in its natural course. Are cases occurring in increasing numbers or is the outbreak just about over? If cases are continuing to occur, your first priority will more than likely be controlling the outbreak. So you want well to assess its extent and the characteristics of the population risk so you can design measures to prevent additional cases. On the other hand, if an outbreak appears almost over, you may want to focus on investigating further to identify its source and using that information to develop measures that will prevent further outbreaks. The balance between instituting control measures and conducting further investigation depends on how much you know about the agent causing the illness, the source of the agent, and its mode of transmission since you cannot design control measures without this information. So where do you think we lie in the current coronavirus outbreak? Are we in preventing future outbreak or are we in the control phase? So this is the natural history of disease, usually of an outbreak. And you will definitely see recent graphs of coronavirus showing the same graph, wherein a first case is reported and then reported in the hospital. Then you would see the increase of number of cases and then continually to decrease. And here is the reason why there is lockdown. We have to flatten the curve 
as the intervention sets in, we aim to decrease the number of cases such that to prevent and control the outbreak. Research opportunities. Another important objective of outbreak investigations is simply to gain additional knowledge. Each outbreak offers a unique opportunity to study the natural history of the disease in question, including the agent, mode of transmission, and incubative period. For a newly recognized disease such as coronavirus, there is the opportunity to study the clinical spectrum of the illness. Investigators also attempt to characterize the populations at greatest risk and to identify specific risk factors. Even with familiar diseases, investigations can learn more about the impact of control measures and the usefulness of new epidemiological and laboratory techniques. For example, an outbreak of measles in a highly immunized community provides a setting for investigators to study the effectiveness of vaccine, the effect of aged vaccination, and the duration of protection afforded by the vaccine. Training Opportunities Investigating an outbreak requires a combination of diplomacy, logical thinking, problem solving, quantitative skills, epidemiological know-how, and judgment. These skills improve with practice and experience. For this reason, many investigative teams pair a seasoned epidemiologist with an epidemiologist in training who gains valuable on-the-job training and experience while assisting in the investigation and control of the outbreak. Program Considerations Health departments routinely use a variety of programs to control and prevent illness, such as tuberculosis, vaccine-preventable diseases, and sexually transmitted diseases. By investigating an outbreak of a disease targeted by one of these programs, health departments may discover populations at risk that have been overlooked failures in the program's intervention strategy, changes in the agent causing the disease, or events beyond the scope of the program. This information can then be used to improve control and prevention efforts. Public, political, or legal concerns sometimes override scientific concerns in the decision to conduct an investigation. Increasingly, the public has taken an interest in disease, clusters, and potential environmental exposures and has called upon health departments to investigate. Such investigations almost never identify a link between the disease and the suspected source. Nevertheless, many health departments have learned that it is essential to be responsibly responsive to public concerns even if the concern has little scientific basis. They also see these instances as opportunities to educate the public in some instances. Investigations are required by law. So, what are the steps in outbreak investigation? So, before leaving for the field, the epidemiologist researches the disease and gathers supplies and equipment that you will need. You make necessary administrative and personal arrangements for such things as travel, consults with all parties to determine their role in the investigation, and who local contacts will be once you arrive on the scene. So these are the things that you must prepare for field work, field preparation, administrative, your network. Then you establish the existence of 
So what is an outbreak? It's the occurrence of cases of an illness, specific health-related behavior, or other health-related events clearly in excess of the normal expectancy, which means it's greater than two standard deviations from the mean. A single case of a disease that is not supposed to develop or occur in the community is also considered an outbreak, such as the re-emergence of measles or polio in the Philippines. Change in reporting procedures or case definition. So, even if all the current number of reported cases exceeds expected number, the excess may not necessarily indicate an outbreak. Reporting may rise because of changes in local reporting procedures, changes in the case definition, increased interest because of local or national awareness, or improvements in diagnostic procedures. For example, if a new physician infection control nurse or healthcare facility is reporting cases more consistently than they were reported in the past, the numbers would go up even though there might be no change in the actual occurrence of the disease. Finally, particularly in areas with sudden changes in population size, such as resort areas, college towns, and migrant farming areas, Changes in the number of reported cases simply reflect changes in the size of the population. Then we verify diagnosis. So verifying the diagnosis requires review of the clinical findings, symptoms, and features of illness, and laboratory results for the people who are affected. If there is any uncertainty about the laboratory findings, a laboratory technician should review the techniques being used. If the epidemiologist expects a need for specialized lab work, they will begin obtaining the appropriate specimens, isolates, and other laboratory material from a sufficient number of patients as soon as possible. Finally, the epidemiologic should visit several of the people who became ill. If the epidemiologist does not have the clinical background to verify the diagnosis, a doctor or other qualified clinician should do so. Regardless of background, the epidemiologist should see and talk to some of those people to gain a better understanding of the disease and those affected by it. And in addition, they may be able to gather critical information by asking such questions as, what were their exposures before becoming ill? What do they think caused their illness? Do they know anyone else with the disease? Do they have anything in common with others who have the disease? Conversations with patients are very helpful in generating hypotheses about the cause, source, and spread of disease. Then we could define and identify cases. Define and identifying cases. Establish a case definition. It's a standard set of criteria for deciding whether a person should be classified as having the disease or conduction under study. It usually includes components such as clinical information, characteristics of the people who are affected, information about the location and place, and a specification of time during which the outbreak occurred. So we classify cases, confirmed, possible, and probable. So confirmed usually has laboratory verification. Probable has clinical features without lab verification. And possible usually has few or typical clinical. So this information must be entered in a case report form. Traditionally, this information is collected. So data abstract form, epidemiologist 10, abstract selected critical items in a table called line listing. 
In a line listing, each column represents an important variable such as name or identification number, age, sex, and case classification, while each row represents a different case by number. New cases are added to the line listing as they are identified. These simple forms allows the investigators to scan key information on every case and update it easily. Even the era of microcomputers, many epidemiologists still maintain a handwritten line listing of key data items and turn to their computers for more complex manipulations of data. Here's the portions of an outbreak of hepatitis A. So if you will compare it, line listing is like the tagging of coronavirus cases where in each case is designated a number so that we know number, location, and risk factor. Then we describe and orient the data in terms of time. So once some of the data have been collected, the epidemiologist can begin to characterize an outbreak by time, place, and person. In fact, the step may be performed several times during the course of an outbreak. Characterizing an outbreak by these variables is called descriptive epidemiology because the epidemiologist describes what has occurred in the population under study. This step is critical for several reasons. First, by becoming familiar with the data, the team learns what information is reliable and information is reported by many of the people affected. And what may not be reliable? Second, it provides a comprehensive description of outbreak by showing its trend over time, its geographical extent, and the population affected by the disease. This description lets the epidemiologist begin to assess the outbreak in light of what is known about the disease. The usual source, mode of transmission, risk factors, etc. And to develop causal hypothesis, you can in turn test this hypothesis using the techniques of analytic epidemiology described later. Then we evaluate the hypothesis. The show the time course of an epidemic by drawing a graph of the number of cases by their date of onset. This graph, called an epidemic curve, or epicurve for short, gives a simple display of the outbreak's magnitude and time trend. The following example depicts the first outbreak of Legionnaire's disease in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1976. An epidemic curve provides a great deal of information. First, epidemiologists will usually be able to tell where they are in the course of the epidemic and possibly to project its future course. Second, if the disease has been identified and its usual incubation period is known, epidemiologists may be able to estimate a probable time period of exposure and can then develop a questionnaire focusing on that time period. Finally, it may be possible to draw inferences about the epidemic pattern. For example, whether it is an outbreak resulting from a common source exposure from person-to-person -person spread or both, which is described below. So this is an example of epidemic curve. As seen in the slide, one by one, you can plot your cases according to the time of onset. In an epidemic curve, you can identify the peak, the date of the peak, the beginning of the period curve, date of start, and the end of the curve or the date of end, and the entire period of the disease outbreak. That's the peak, the beginning, and the end, and the entire period. Time variables of ex epidemic curves. One may be sporadic, as shown in the graph labeled A. It could be endemic in the graph labeled B. C is an example of a graph of a point epidemic. 
And letter D is a propagating epidemic, which graph closely resembles the coronavirus outbreak as of now. Common source outbreak. One source, one exposure. So, epidemic curve, exposure date, sickness date, so that is your incubation period. Propagated source, it's what's happening in the coronavirus. One infects two, these two in people infect two more, then these two people infect two more, so it is increasing in an exponential manner. This is an example of your Ebola, that is why contact tracing and surveillance is greatly needed. So, computing incubation period, timing of presumed exposure is known. The epic curves can also be used to estimate two important outbreak characteristics. The probable incubation period and the period of exposure of the causative organism. If the timing of the presumed exposure is known, epic curves can be used to estimate the incubation period of the disease and this may facilitate the identification of the causative agent. This is because the period between the known or hypothesized exposure time and the peak of the epic curve represents the hypothesized median incubation period. So if we know the pathogen, Thus, the incubation period as well as the median incubation period, the date of exposure can be computed as the date of the peak minus the median incubation period. In our case, it will be 10 minus 8. This equals to 2, and this should be the day of exposure. This is 10, the peak, minus exposure, it equals to 2. So if we know the range of the incubation period, sample the minimum and maximum incubation period because we have identified the pathogen, the exposure period will be computed as date of start minus minimum incubation period and date of end minus maximum incubation period. In our example, the start of the onset is 6 and the minimum incubation period is 5. Hence, start is 1 in the same way that the end date of onset is 15 and the maximum incubation is 13. Therefore, it's 3. The exposure period is 10 from day 1 to day 3. Cases that stand apart, these are outliers, may be just as informative as the overall pattern. An early case may represent a background case, a source of the epidemic, or a person who was exposed earlier than most of the people affected. Similarly, late cases may be unrelated to the outbreak, may have especially long incubation periods, may indicate exposure later than most of the people affected, or may be secondary cases. That is, persons may have become ill after being exposed to someone who was part of the initial outbreak. Spot map is important in characterizing outbreaks in places. It provides information on the geographic extent of a problem and may also show clusters or patterns that provide clues to the identity and origins of the problem. A simple and useful technique for looking at geographic patterns is to plot on a spot map of the area where the affected people live, work, or may have been exposed. 
A spot map of cases in a community may show clusters or patterns that reflect water supplies and currents or proximity to a restaurant or grocery store. On a spot map of a hospital, nursing home, or other such facilities usually indicates either a focal source or person-to-person -person spread, while the scattering of cases throughout a facility is more consistent with a common source such as dining hall. In studying an outbreak of surgical wound infections in a hospital, we might plot cases by operating room, recovery room, and ward room to look for clustering. The map included is that originally developed by John Snow. In England, showing the cluster of cholera cases around the Broad Street pump. For example, cases of coronavirus has been mainly in Metro Manila, particularly in the city of Quezon City. This is what John Snow plotted as the source of cholera, a Broad Street water pump. Then we could characterize by person. Epidemiologists determine what populations are at risk for the disease by characterizing an outbreak by person. Such populations are usually defined by personal characteristics, use of medications, etc. These factors are important because they may be related to susceptibility to disease and to opportunities for exposure. Then we so in real life, epidemiologists usually begin to generate hypotheses to explain why and how the outbreak occurred when they first learn about the problem. But at this point in an investigation, after they have interviewed some affected people, spoken with other health officials in the community, and characterized the outbreak by time, place, and person. Their hypothesis will be sharpened and now accurate focus. The hypothesis should address the source of the agent, the mode of transmission, and the exposure that caused the disease. Also, the hypothesis should be proposed in a way that can be tested. Then we There's two approaches to this. Depending on the nature of the data, the first, we co the comparison of the hypothesis with the established facts and analytic epidemiology with, which allows you to test your hypothesis. First method used is when the evidence is so strong that the hypothesis does not need to be tested. A 1991 investigation of an outbreak of vitamin D intoxication in Massachusetts is a good example. All of the people affected drank milk delivery to their homes by a local dairy. Investigators hypothesized that the dairy was the source and the milk was the vehicle of excess vitamin D. When they visited the dairy, they quickly recognized that inadvertently being added to milk was added. No further analysis was needed. The second method, analytic epidemiology, is used when the cause is less clear. With this method, the hypotheses are tested by using comparison groups to quantify relationships between various exposures and the disease. These are two types of analytic studies, cohort studies, and case control. Cohort studies compare groups of people who have been exposed to suspected risk factors with groups who have not been exposed. Case control studies compare people with a disease with a group of people without the disease. The nature of the outbreak determines which of these studies is used. The table on the next page is based on a famous outbreak of gastroenteritis following a church supper in Oswego, New York. In 1940, and illustrates the use of a cohort study. One of the 80 people who attended the supper, 75 were interviewed. 46 people met the case definition. So how would you calculate the attack rates for each food item?
So, vanilla ice cream as the implicated vehicle or source, the relative risk is calculated as 80 divided by 14 or 5.7. This relative risk indicates that people who ate the vanilla ice cream were 5.7 times more likely to become ill than were those who did not eat the vanilla ice cream. Then we refine hypothesis and carry out. When analytic epidemiological studies do not confirm to a hypothesis, epidemiologists reconsider their hypothesis and look for new vehicles for modes of transmission. This is the time they meet with case patients to look for common links, to visit their homes, to look at the products at their shelves. An investigation of outbreak of salmonella in Ohio during 1981 illustrates this point. A case control study failed to turn up a food source as a common vehicle. Interestingly, people 15 to 35 years of age lived in all of the households with cases, but in only 41% of control households. This difference caused the investigators to consider vehicles of transmission to which young adults might be exposed. By asking about drug use in a second case control study, the investigators found out that illegal use of marijuana was the likely vehicle. Lab analysts subsequently isolated the outbreak strain of the salmonella from several samples of marijuana provided by case patients. While epidemiology can implicate vehicles and guide appropriate public health action, lab evidence can clinch the findings. The laboratory was essential in the outbreak of salmonella in linked to use of contaminated marijuana. The investigation of the outbreak of Legionnaire's disease earlier was not considered complete until the new organism was isolated in the lab over six months after the outbreak actually had occurred. Environmental studies often help explain why an outbreak occurred and may be very, very important in some settings. For example, in an investigation on an outbreak of shigellosis among swimmers in the Mississippi River, a local sewage plant was identified as the cause of the outbreak. Then we implement Even though implementing control and prevention measures is listed as step 9, in a real investigation, this should be done as soon as possible. Control measures which can be implemented early, if the source of an outbreak is known, should be aimed at specific links in the chain of infection, the agent, the source, or the reservoir. For example, an outbreak might be controlled by destroying contaminated food, sterilizing contaminated water, destroying breeding sites, or requiring an infectious food handler to stay away from work until he or she is well. In order situations, direct control measures might be rejected at interrupting transmission or exposure, for example, to limit the airborne spread of an infectious against among residents of a nursing home. The method of cohorting could be used by putting infected people together in a separate area to prevent exposure to others. People washing to reduce their risk of acquiring Lyme disease are instructed to avoid wooded areas or to wear insect repellent and proactive clothing. Finally, in some outbreaks, control measures are directed at reducing susceptibility. To such examples are immunization and chemoprophylaxis chemo by taking medications for travelers. What are the current prevention measures used in coronavirus? And so the final task of an epidemiologist is an investigation is to communicate their findings to others who need to know. This communication usually takes two forms, an oral briefing for local health authorities and a written report. 
The oral briefing should be attended by the local health authorities and people responsible for implementing control and preventive measures. This presentation is an opportunity for the epidemiologist to describe what was done, what was found, and the epidemiological things should be done about. The epidemiologist should present the findings in scientifically objective fashion and should be able to defend their conclusion and recommendations. They should also provide a written report that follows the usual scientific format of introduction, background methods, results discussion, and recommendations. By formally presenting recommendations, the report provides a blueprint for action. It also serves as a record of performance, a document for potential legal uses, and reference if the health department encounters a similar situation in the future. Finally, a report that finds its way into the public health literature serves the broader purpose of contributing to the scientific knowledge base of epidemiology and public